So we are in the weld base today and what we will be looking at is an introduction to MIG, MAG and Flux Core Welding using the EWM Phoenix XQ set. Uh, so without any due, let's let's get on with it. So really, regardless of the type of MIG MAG set you have, if you've got a more basic one than this, um, the general setup is, is the same. So we have a power unit, and on this one, our wire feed is within the, the unit itself. It keeps it relatively small, and you can see it fits under our table. You have a torch lead, which comes out and goes around there, comes to the torch which has got our control trigger and things on the end. We have a return cable, which leaves and goes up to the clamp, which connects it to the table itself. Um, return cable is the correct term, but a lot of people call it an earth return or an earth lead, but return cable for your exams and things like that is the correct one. What's gonna happen is we pull the trigger and we get the electrical flow from the power source through the torch into the workpiece, the power will return back down the return cable and back into the power source to complete our circuit. This one is water cooled, so we've got a water reservoir there with the cold and the hot water circulation going around. And we have some other uh, connectors and things for uh, the snazzy stuff that the EWM unit can do. Um, but for some, some units, that's all you're going to get is uh, torch lead and return lead, and away you go. So if I turn the power source on here, and it goes through its startup system, nice lights, cool looking, good bit of kit. Um, you see here, yeah, it's booted up on the last settings I was using. Uh, so 109 amps, 18 uh, 0.7 volts now watch is as I change the amperage here you can see that the voltage is is correcting through its presets in the machine to what it thinks the best voltage should be but if I need to trim the voltage I can trim it up and down to get that get that additional little bit of you know play and and fine tuning for what we want click this button here I can move along to wire feed. So we could, instead of working on amperage levels, work on a wire feed amount. Now, this is our first thing to really start to, to, to pin down, is that wire feed and amperage are generally connected. If wire feed goes up, amperage must go up. So I don't need to show amperage, it must go up. And then with that, we're trimming our, our voltage to suit. If amperage didn't go up when I increased my wire feed, what would happen? Well, the wire would come out and hit the workpiece and would spool out on the table. Vice versa, if I come back to showing amperage, is amperage goes up, wire feed must go up, because if it doesn't, I'll just burn the wire back and I'll lose my arc. So you can work on either or, you know, Older welding procedures and that do often show wire feed as an output, but amperage is, is a good one because you can measure it and you can look at it and we can put a decent amount of range. It's easier to put ranges and stuff on, on that, I feel anyway. In the top here, we've got general sort of process of how our arc is going to progress once we press the start button. So here we've got a bit of pre-gas, we've got a, a, like a peak start and then our running amperage. And then if we've got pulse, that is going from peak to pulse, peak to pulse, peak to pulse. And then what happens at the end of that process and any pulse gas we're gonna have on it. Uh, we've got some settings to pull wire through and do some pre-gas. So if I press that button, I don't know if you can hear that, but I can start pulling gas through from our gas bottle to purchase system. So when we press go, we know we've got gas. So if you just want to check if you if you have got gas. In the middle here, we've got a job number. Now what this is, 
is the set comes with a lot of presets in it. Okay, Synergic systems are really cool for this. Um, and what we can do here is if I open up the wire feed, I'm gonna to come to a, a chart, which as you can see here, I've got mild steel, stainless steel and aluminium color code. Down the side here, so I go to steel, which is this orange color. I can pick what type of gas I've got and from that gas, what wire size I'm using, and it will give me a program. Now, I can take that program and stick it into the machine here at the front. And on the EWM set, what I'm doing is clicking this job list number three seconds. One, two, three, there you go. So I've got my job. So now I can select through different job numbers and that'll give me the settings it feels is best for the input I've put into it. Now, that makes this really straightforward to use. You know, If you kind of roughly know what, what you're doing, it'll give you some settings and we can go from there. So now we've looked at the control panel and how the general setup of the machine works, we can start to look at our consumable. So, here we have two different consumables. So you've got plastic uh, spools and metal spools. Some people prefer either or, I don't think it really matters. But the thing to re remember is if these get dropped, the plastic ones, they tend to break and that can cause wire feed issues. And with the wire ones, the cage gets crushed when they get uh, dropped or knocked. And that again can trap the wire and cause wire feed. Uh, we're going to set up today with this uh, plastic one just because it's, it's easier for me to do because it's on the top. Uh, but the same requirements here stand for whatever wire you're going to put into your, um, your wire feed. So looking at our wire feed unit here, if I pop this open, we've got our settings panel, we've got a hanger for our spool, We've got our drives and we've got some uh, extra controls here, which I'll go through in a second. So I've got my uh, wire spool here. You'll see on it that the, the wire is rotating around in any direction and then it will be hooked through and, and caught there just to keep this, this spool from on, on, on riding. Just be careful with them wires sometimes because you know sometimes they're long, sometimes they're short. Um, the unit itself, what we do is we just unscrew this holder and then on the, the drive itself, the drive shaft itself here, there's a pin. Now on the spool, you've got your main drive shaft position and then a pin holder. We've just got to line them up so we can drop that in there. So you've just got to kind of move it around. Sometimes it moves with you. Uh, it's on there now. Put our holder back on. Okay. And now, using our set of pliers, what we're going to do is just unhook this. So take it out, but keep a bit of pressure on the wire. What you don't want to do is unhook it because it will unspool because it's 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 coiled. Holding it, just trip. We'll just trim that off so we get a nice, nice clean, clean edge. And then the thing is, is to then push it through the guides for the rollers. Again, keeping a bit of positive pressure on the, the wire itself so it doesn't unspool. The tricky thing here is getting it through all of the uh, connectors. So if I drop you down here to show you a bit closer into, into the spool. So in our drive unit, you see we've got two drive units here which are on little springs that come up when they're not held down. We've got the holders for these as well. So the wire's coming through, through this guide tube here, through each of our rollers, if I move this out of the way, you see, there's the wire coming through and then through, and in the end here, there's another little tube which joins it to the torch. So the thing is, is to just kind of get it guided in and into that, into that tube. Just push it through a little bit. 
and then we can bring these rollers down and connect them up. Like that, and that's it on. Now, looking at the top here, what we've got is a reverse and a forward for the rolls. So what we're gonna do is now push the wire all the way through till it comes out of the end of our uh, torch. Now take this shroud off. What you've got here on the torch is the torch head and then the contact tip. Sometimes it's best to take this contact tip off because the wire can get stuck sometimes and then we'll put it back on once we've threaded the wire all the way through. So there is, I'm just gonna press the button. And there you go, our wire is going through. Now, there's a couple of different rolls we can have. There's two main types, one being a V and one being like a half moon or half rounded shape. Now the V rollers are good for carbon steel wires which are quite strong and you can get a bit of pressure on them without them snapping but if you try to use the v roller on a softer material like aluminium then it has a tendency to cut into the wire and make it jam or shear the wire in two so you're basically cutting it um so there's that to look out for as well now that feels like that's close there you go so there it is out there. So I'm gonna put my contact tip back over that wire now and just make sure it came out nicely. And we'll screw that back into place. And when I then put my shroud back on, I can then take my snips, cut it off, and that's the wire in and ready to go. Now I've used a flux core wire in here just because this is what, what we've got on, on the shop floor, but you know, it's the same process for any wire. Now in the torch, what you might see is two different types of torch liner, that being a wire sort of spring type or a nylon. Uh, Again, depending if you're using soft materials or uh, hard materials, depends which one you want to use. So the springs are good for hard materials like carbon steel because they wear out a lot slower. Uh, the nylon is great for the soft materials because you won't see an abrasion on the wire. However, the nylon can give up relatively quickly and you can start to get contamination in the well pool. So you've got to keep an eye on it. You know, they're consumables. We treat them like we, we should treat them. Um, and that gets us sorted. Now, just while we're here, we can look on the inside of this set and we see we've got this key. What this does is I can lock the set off and take the key out. So now the settings we had on the front of the machine can't be changed. So you can, if you only want your wellers to use one setting, well, you can set it, lock it out and then go from there. But you know, I'll leave mine in and sort it so we can play. So now we've got everything set up. Uh, we've got our, our torch in, our return cables are connected. We understand how to change the amperage and voltages on our sets. And we've got a wire in place. We can now look at our shielding gas. First thing here, and it's a critical difference, is there is a difference between MIG and MAG welding. MIG is metal inert gas, and that's primarily for aluminium. Argon produces a nice stable arc, but it doesn't produce a lot of heat, okay? When we go to carbon steel, we need that little bit more oomph to, to the process. So we add an active gas. Normally that is CO2. Now a very common active gas percentage is about 20% CO2. So mag, metal, active gas, has a CO2 normal addition to the process. And you need that for steel. So when we call everything MIG, we're wrong. We're not, we're not being accurate enough to describe the process we're using if we're welding steel. So when we look at regulators and setting up the gas bottle, there are a few different types. I really like this 
air liquid system. Um, what it is is a quick release fitting which goes onto the top of the gas bottles. The gas bottles have tags in them uh, so they can be tracked and, and I think that's you know 21st century technology being used the way it should be. So what we do is we just slot this unit on. Look, I can, I'm doing this with one hand. Um, take the quick release fitting from our set and that goes onto the back here. Again, one hand with the camera. So that's on, on like that. And then we can just pull this on and I've got gas. I've got the output of my gas, how much is in my bottle. And I've got the flow rate we're currently set to. So I can just change that by changing this, this dial up, up to here. Uh, with Mi'kmaq, you know, 18 to 20 is kind of going to be a nice play, but we'll have a go and see if we can we can amend it or anything. Another thing about these uh, Enegas Air Liquid bottles is we've got a nice visual addition to it to see how much gas is in. So as the gas runs out, we get that turns to red. I think you can see the red on, on this bottle a little bit um, to tell us visually when we're about to run out, which makes it really, really cool. These are smaller bottles. You can get gas bottles in two sizes. We use the, the smaller sort of two thirds size, but you can get the, the much taller ones as well. Here we have a more standard regulator. This is on our oxygen cylinder for our oxypropane cutting and preheating torches. Thing with these to kind of make sure is that on a standard regulator, you will have a life stated nice and clearly. Normally it was a hard stamp in the back of the regulator. So looking at the back of the regulator, you can see here we've got this replace 2025. Uh, so in two years time, we take this off if it's not been damaged in the meantime and we, we get rid of it and we replace the regulator. So this is always something to check to make sure that you're within date within your regulators. Now we've selected our consumable electrode filler wire. We have it in the machine. We have our roller set. We have our variables set for our program selection on this set or our amps and volts and we've selected a active gas, which is a argon CO2, because we're using flux core carbon steel. We can now look at how the process is actually gonna work. So when I press the trigger, what's gonna happen is power is gonna flow from the power source through to the contact tip. The contact tip then touches my consumable electrode which then moves the power into that distance of the wire the wire heats up because now i've got an electrical current making its way through this wire here and that has an effect of almost preheating the wire so it's easier for it to melt and the longer i make this stick out the more preheating the more resistance that's going to be in that wire the hot it's hotter it's going to be the easier it's going to burn but that can throw some uh, issues with arc stability and, and, and the like out so you know we like to keep this distance fairly constant a lot of people write into their procedures about 25 mil give or take um, from the end of that wire we then jump an electrical arc so if I'm on my, my workpiece here, we have a slight gap, the arc jumps, and that arc runs at about 6,000 degrees. Okay, really, really hot. The material, if we're welding steel, is going to melt, is going to form a weld pool. It's something around 15 to 1,600 degrees. As that happens, the wire feed is pushing more wire into the melting pool and the fact the wire is melting off as well and bulking up that weld pool to produce the weld. And we are then going to start to travel. Helping us, we have a shielding gas. So out of these ports here in this white bit, we have the shielding gas being pushed from our gas bottle and that is coming down 
through our shroud here and enveloping the arc area and pushing out the atmosphere. So now we have an organ rich environment with a little bit of CO2 in, which helps the arc, the arc run and, and, and produce what it needs to do. So what I've done here is just set up a plate for a bit of bead on plate welding. Um, you can see I've already put down a, a sort of a test weld there just to make sure everything was, was going in okay. And that means I've got a little bit of oxidized end to my uh, consumable wire. So what I'm gonna do is just push that out a little bit and then trim the wire. That's gonna make sure I've got a good electrical con uh, conductivity to the start of the wire when we start the weld but also that we don't get any contamination into the weld itself when we arc up. Uh, next thing is to do is to make sure that you're, you're comfortable, you know, big part of welding is, is always to be as comfortable as you can be. And of course, that isn't always possible. If you're under things or in the mud or on the ground, it's, yeah, it, but we're trying to make it as best we can. So I'm gonna make sure that if I'm gonna weld along here on this plate, that, as I start to weld, I know I can get all the way along. Some people like to pivot. Um, for something like this, I'll be happy just kind of sliding my arm gently along. Um, one of the things to do is not to be too tense. Don't be grabbing the torch or the, uh, the switch or anything like that. You want to be welding a long time, all day if possible. So just keep yourself relaxed, keep yourself uh, comfortable. Now because I've been using a flux core wire, the top of this weld has a slag. Now, as the weld metal cools, the slag has a different uh, contraction rate, so we'll, we'll, we'll shrink and start to peel off. Now, you can see that kind of happening there, um, here. So if I just take it off this stand, so here we can see the slag starting to peel as it contracts. Now, it'll get to a certain size and, and break, so what we're going to do is we'll just tip, tap this off a little bit so we've got our, our length of slag there. And then the next bit will start to lift as well. Uh, it might just break off occasionally so we'll just, we can just gently just push that and we'll get a clean weld with no slag on it. And then you can see there there's the slag still on, on that bit. I haven't knocked it off just to show you. So that, that will come along now. The thing is to make sure we remove all of this slag before we put a weld on the top. Because this weld, if we weld onto the top of this, we'll get slag inclusions into our weld metal. So all of this just needs to be knocked off, cleaned up. So we've got a brush, and then we've got a weld, which we can then continue with.